So I often talk about the importance of choice-based art education and that every project needs to be tied somehow to the students' ideas, their thoughts, maybe their cultures, somehow um, something personal that's going to differentiate each project so that we know, uh, you know, at the end of the project, you know, students can say, oh yeah, that one's mine, that one's mine as opposed to some of this cookie cutter stuff where they all kind of look the same and you got to look at the name to kind of figure out who did what. And, you know, they become less personally um, expressive. So with this in mind, some people might think, well, I guess he doesn't do crafts because crafts, you know, the, the goal is to have an end product that, uh, you know, looks like a certain thing. And um, that's not true. Uh, we know when we really look at the, the history of crafts, they're very important for us to incorporate into our lessons because of the cultural connections, the historical connections, uh, all of this kind of stuff. It's very rich and there's lots you can do to incorporate craft into your art class and still make it art uh, without you know resorting to cookie cutter kinds of things. So for example, um, I went to Oaxaca, Mexico, and I was able to get this sculpture, and I met the family who created it, and um, got a chance to see the process, and it was just delightful. And you could see the amazing detail in this, the tiny, tiny brushwork. It's just crazy. Um, and this is a craft, but it is definitely art, um, because this is expressive. Um, there is a sense of movement about it. All the art elements can be seen in it. And even if they tried to make it again, it would be definitely different. Um, but there is some expressive qualities to the shapes and the colors that they've created for this particular animal. And if they did it in blue, it would have additional, uh, a, a different emotional value to it, so to speak. Another one I have is from uh, in the Sahara Desert. I used to live in Egypt and I went on a trip to the Siwa Oasis and I got a wedding basket there. And um, it's just a beautiful woven basket um, that is just really delightful and celebrational looking. The colors and everything just exude this idea of celebration of a marriage. And um, it was supposed to hold, you know, some of the uh, you know, gifts for the wedding, or maybe this one would be to hold bread, or, you know, there were different purposes for each basket, but this is definitely a wedding basket, and they're kind of hard to come by, but, you know, it's, it's art in its own way. Um, it's an artful craft. So how can we do this in our classes? And I'm going to project some images up here and talk about it, but one of the key things that I use in my classroom is based on a book that I wrote called The Emotional Color Wheel. So here's the cover. And inside I talk about different ways that are internationally known um, to express emotions through color and shape. And we know like around the world, the color red is going to be associated with blood because everybody has had that experience, whether you're in you know, a very remote village or you live in New York City, you see red on the ground, you're gonna be alarmed and that's going to you know, do that. Other uh, associations with red might be, you know, celebration or, you know, high attention and uh, aggression. There are other things. So all the colors and all the shapes will have emotional values. And I'll go ahead and link up here to a video that kind of takes you through that. So I have two different posters that I have available depending on my audience. So if I have elementary kids, I use this poster because it's very basic and simple and just gives you your primary and secondary colors uh, plus some information about black, white, and brown and gray. Uh, and then I have this other poster, a little bigger uh, and more detailed for my high school students so they can look up, you know, the emotional value of terror, you know, and they can look close and each of those separate colors are going to have a different sort of emotional value. Um, and not all of them are internationally, you know, known, but, you know, they come close. We know that the warm colors are more uh, active, some more aggressive, and then the cool colors tend to be more reserved, more calm, more quiet. Um, and this is based in the psychology of color. So I did an awful lot of research to make sure, you know, we're kind of in the right area uh, for this idea. And this way, when students choose their colors or their shapes, they can have a personal connection to that on a symbolic level. So we could take something like the, um, the Dios de Ojo, you know, the, the God's Eye 
uh, that I have up here. And you could see that the color choices are thoughtful, that they chose blue for, you know, a certain emotional value, that orange is kind of, you know, represent that, uh, that activity level, that black is a color of mystery, and that each color choice in there, uh, the student can then explain what does that mean. Uh, we have another one here with kids with, you know, an arm cast on. It's a great way to kind of play around with plaster and get the feel of that, and then they decorated it uh, in their own way, to, like about their own superpower, like what is it they wish they could do if this was, you know, some kind of magical thing. Um, so everyone's going to have a different idea about what that would mean to them, so it is going to differentiate the projects. Origami is another thing that's very craft-oriented and actually um, very, you know, converse thinking. You know, you come up with the one product like the origami bird. But if you look in the, you know, the, the possibilities of origami, there's one that I do with my little ones uh, that's an origami puppet. So they take the puppet mouth, um, they learn a little bit about origami, and then they decorate it to make it into a bird or make it into an animal, and then they do a little mini play with that. So that can help differentiate them. So, you know, with origami, usually it's, you know, one kind of product, it's either right or wrong. This way, um, a very simple product can be done in many ways. And here you can see a group of children kind of posing with their puppets. Um, I showed you my... Um, Alibricus example, and here's another one by a student. I don't have them do a particular animal. I have them try and pick an animal that they feel fits with their personality. Or if they're a little older, they can do a little research either on their phones or their devices to find out their cultural background and then look up animals in that particular country or culture and then choose an animal from that. So it has a deeper kind of cultural connection, which is really great. So here we have a zebra and the patterns are going to be, again, speaking to that student's personality. They made specific choices. Um, sometimes we get silly in the, in the art classroom and I do this thing with uh, you know, my, my younger students where we make uh, aluminum foil hats and we're trying to keep the aliens out of our brains. And what don't we want the aliens finding out? Um, so the hat is supposed to uh, help keep away them from knowing this particular thing about us. So their sculpture is supposed to speak to what they want to protect uh, the aliens from knowing about. And each kid is going to interpret that in a very different way. And we have an awful lot of fun wearing our aluminum foil hats through the day and seeing how many people think we're a little nuts. Um, Here's another one where I have uh, lanterns, and the, uh, we use the Asia connection with the paper lanterns, and what do they mean in that culture? And we're not trying to appropriate that culture. We don't do their patterns. We then have students, again, research their own culture, look up their own patterns, uh, and then apply that to the lantern, and then we go ahead and put those on display. So it becomes this multicultural sort of focus thing with uh, tissue paper on these uh, simple lanterns. Another one is making the students bring in their item that is then going to be turned into a work of art. So we can see this concrete teddy bear. Um, so I found this interesting project where you essentially turn the teddy bears inside out, fill them with concrete, uh, and then we turn them into these expressive, you know, zombie post-apocalyptic sculptures. And they have a lot of fun destroying their stuffed animals to kind of make this work. So I have this lesson and others of these on my blog at artedguru.com. Uh, another one here, uh, a puppet. So when we do puppetry, it's not a particular puppet I want them to do. Again, we can research their cultures or research their personalities. This, uh, the artist, student artist in this one was actually a very tall young lady. So she decided that she was going to do a giraffe. And uh, we use an old shirt, you know, as part, part of the body. And then um, in the high school, we did this and we had the students go do performances for the local elementary schools and uh, anti-bullying and stuff like that. Uh, if you're going to do sewing, why not have fun sewing, uh, you know, items that are going to be, again, unique to the students. So here we have food items and they created a stuffed animal of their favorite food. And I had some googly eyes that they were welcome to add on there. So you see three different students' interpretations of that. I gave them the basic ideas of, you know, how do we sew? How do we put things together? I'd give some advice here and there about how, um, what form, you know, might work best for what it is that they were creating. And we came up with some delightful stuff. 
Another unit that I do is bonsai trees. We explore what is, you know, bonsai mean in history. And then we do these wire trees. And it's very easy for us to just kind of follow a formula and make a tree. But you can see that these are very expressive and personal. So we have one growing out of a book and there are letters instead of um, uh, leaves on the tree and another one uh, of a car and we have kind of uh, a tree with metallic leaves growing out of it. So each one of these had a personal message that was expressive and the students at the end of this do a little writing assignment about a half a page explaining what it is that they created and that goes on display along with their artwork uh, when we put that out. So sometimes in ceramics, we're um, making a pot that a plant is gonna go in, maybe we've got some seeds available and stuff like that. And that can be you know, fun for the kids, but there's less room for maybe something expressive, particularly maybe in the decoration or something. So I have students do pinch pot faces uh, and they do kind of this self portrait thing or they can kind of create a character here. My student made a zombie. Uh, and then the hair growing out of it, you know, is obviously green, so it sort of fits in with that uh, particular theme. So, you know, you could tell the character of this student right away, uh, just based on this. Uh, another one I've done with uh, clay is we do the anti-cup. Uh, and I only use clear glaze, white clay. We're not using all sorts of colors that we might have available uh, in the studio. And they need to reinterpret a cup and pair it with something else that they feel, again, that they need to express. So we do a little pre-writing, think about different things. Uh, it could be, you know, a memory. It could be a situation, you know, in ways that we can interpret the shape now or the form uh, that we can be interpreting into a cup. So we have one that the student inverted the cup and decided to kind of make it into a tree-like form or a flower kind of form. Another one where they've reinterpreted it as kind of an echo. So we have a cup in a cup in a cup. So it has a surreal sort of connotation to it. Uh, and then this last one is a cup that doesn't really hold anything, um, that it's supposed to be actually holding a memory or a dream. Um, so using these intertwined leaves, you know, it creates the form of a cup, though it's not actually a functional cup. So all of these are going to be kind of expressive and personal and different. And that's how I, you know, judge success to, you know, part of the success of my project is that every student has something different and that they're all personally expressive in some way. This next one is another clay one. You can see the student here holding a bell that he created. It was in memorial to his father who had passed away earlier. He wasn't really able to express that in any other way through his other classes. So we do these um, memorial bells and um, the bell is to either memorialize somebody who has passed away or a historical figure who has passed away. Um, I've also reinterpreted this as a, a bell to ring when you reach an achievement. So students can create a bell in the shape of something they're hoping to achieve or a symbol of something they hope to achieve and then you ring it when you hit that achievement. Uh, here's another one, another memorial bell. So you can tell that they're you know, obviously going to be very personal, the student, because it is something important to them is going to take their time and really pour themselves into the work. Uh, another one is, you know, making, we've done these little um, paper mache birds. I actually use the, um, the magic uh, clay kind of stuff. It's that air dry clay. And we just do like a little banana form or a teardrop form. Uh, and then we put some paper mache over top of that. And then they have to think about the, their own personal attributes and then how we can interpret that uh, for these birds. So I have an example of some that are just birds that are very crafty. Um, they're cute, but there's no personal expression involved in them. And then we have this group uh, where the students had to put their own um, physical attributes and their own um, talents into it. So like this particular bird is really tall. So it's a student who was taller and loves to run. So we see that coming through. Um, the beak is kind of big, so they're, they're a talker. Uh, and then this one, the beak is much uh, smaller and they used uh, purple and blue, so we have cool tones. So this was a more shy student, but they really cared about their appearance. So they were really careful about their hair, so they decided to really um, enhance the plumage on the top of the head. Um, so we get a little bit of a feeling of the student because we're adding in that personality. 
Uh, a lot of times it's kind of fun to do the, the old put some ink down on the paper and you blow it with a straw and you get some things and you turn that into something and that's fine. Uh, you will come up with very diverse results but sometimes we do it like this where we do a portrait and then we blow watercolors. Um, sometimes if the person is really active we can have the watercolors just kind of shoot out in all directions. Colors again, they use the emotional color wheel chart to sort of pick their colors and the emotional values. You can see Amanda here um, has the cool hues. She was definitely very shy, but she said she had lots of ideas that she felt like she couldn't share and they were just kind of zipping through her head. And we can see that, you know, expressed in this. It's kind of common to do this thing where we explore um, Jackson Pollock and we go outside and we kind of splatter some paint. Um, I'm not sure that I, I see as much value in that if maybe perhaps the children are looking up their colors and then using the colors to splash with and then kind of talking about it. If they're very active, you can have very active splashes. If they're more controlled, maybe they do more drips. There are ways to kind of connect that way. Um, sometimes it's fun to just go out and splash paint and then use that uh, canvas uh, to create things that you need. So here these two girls were just they wanted to have bags to kind of carry around all their stuff. I had some of the gentlemen uh, make wallets, um, so we incorporated our sewing skills. Uh, and there were lots of different products made from the canvas uh, that we created outside as a group. So that was kind of fun. And each one made a product that they wanted, um, you know, based on sewing. And I think we did the, uh, the stuffed animals before this so that they had some uh, experience with sewing. Um, so they had more, more choices uh, in this particular one. Here we have a dream catcher um, by another student uh, and in the middle it's the thing that they want to um, catch like we know that the dream catcher the idea uh, is that it catches your bad dreams so they put bait in the middle of it so what is their particular fear so they figured out a symbol for that put it into the middle so that the fear would go in and get caught by it and then the colors on the outside were again using used from the emotional color wheel and colors that were expressive about their personalities and you know the good things that they wanted to have or to bring in the good dreams uh, around that the bad dreams get caught in the middle so again we're having those personal connections and the choices that they're making. And here you can some, see some of those um, God's eye weavings. And again, the colors and shapes for each one uh, represent something unique and individual to that particular student. So I totally believe in exploring craft, but I like to do it in a way that in some way, students will have diverse results at the end. If we're all doing the same kind of thing and the products at the end look the same and the kids have to look for their name to know which one is theirs, I feel like there's a problem with that and that I need to reimagine it. So using some of your own creativity, hopefully you can come up with ways to figure out how to do uh, a project that has diverse results and is maybe more artful for an art class. If you found this helpful, go ahead and subscribe below. Uh, hit that like button and check out some of my other videos in this playlist. Thank you very much.